Once again, we're grateful for the presence of each one. And again, we express our appreciation for being with you. If one did not know better, based on the songs that we have just sung, one would get the idea that the kingdom and the church are the same thing. Well, they are. We appreciate that good song selection. And I hope that there are others who are listening tonight beyond this audience who will pay careful attention to some very familiar passages of Scripture that we are going to use that demonstrate the truth that the Church of Christ is the Kingdom of Christ. It is the heavenly Kingdom present upon this earth. In Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar had a, a dream and He called for his magicians, his astrologers, sorcerers. And he said, tell me the answer to my dream. What does it mean? Well, O king, tell us what you dreamed and we will tell you the meaning of that dream. But unfortunately for them, Nebuchadnezzar had to tell them, I don't remember what it was. He promised that if they were unable to tell him the answer to that dream, I'm going to kill you. Actually said, I shall cut you to pieces. And so again, they said, well, King, tell us what the dream was, and we'll answer it. And Nebuchadnezzar told them, well, you know, if I do that, you're just going to make up some interpretation of it to protect your own lives. But then the word got to Daniel about this dream, and... He went to God about it, and in the night, the interpretation of the dream was revealed unto him. And it's rather lengthy, but let's read from Daniel chapter 2, beginning with verse 31, we'll go down through verse 44. First of all, here's the dream. Thou, O king... Sawest, and behold the great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king, of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, 
and in glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beast of the field, the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron. For as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong, partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. When Daniel began the interpretation of the dream, what he did was describe four kingdoms. The first one being that of Nebuchadnezzar's own kingdom, which is the head of gold. Then following him, as history tells us, was the Medo-Persian Empire. And then came uh, the Greeks. Beginning in verse 40, and going down through verse 43, I think this passage, or part of the passage, is very, very important. Because if you look at the description that Daniel gives, it is clearly the Roman Empire. We know that when the Romans, for instance, went out and captured another people, they would intermingle with those folks. In fact, they would bring them in. They would allow them to keep their own language, their own religions. And while on the one hand, this would tend to lend to strength, it also would lend to weakness. And that's what is being described here. Eventually we know that it's divided into ten separate kingdoms. So I think that these verses are here of, and are of great importance because they tell us this is in fact the Romans. And so that brings us to verse 44. In the days of these kings, in the days of the Roman Empire, the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And so for the purpose of this lesson, when we look at this passage, there are really two points that we want to emphasize, and that would be one of them, that the kingdom, the heavenly kingdom, and by the way, it's a heavenly kingdom, and Daniel says so right here, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom that shall not be destroyed. So we want to emphasize this crucial point that it is at that time when the God of heaven would set up this kingdom. The second point is 
that this kingdom would indeed be a heavenly kingdom and the disciples would come in the time of Jesus and even back John the baptizer and then Jesus himself and his disciples all proclaimed that this kingdom that is a heavenly kingdom because it's set up by God is at hand. And that phrase, at hand, means that it's close. It's imminent. Its coming is not very long. Now let's notice another Old Testament passage that is, that's very familiar to us. From the prophet Isaiah, and you knew where we were going, I know you did. Isaiah chapter 2 particularly verses 2 and 3. The prophet writes, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. Isn't that the same thing Daniel said? And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Describes the day of Pentecost, doesn't it? Because that's where the law of the Lord went forth from. Jerusalem. When is it? In the last days. Now despite all of the wild theories that there are about the last days, there's no passage I know of that is more clear about it than Hebrews 1, 1, and 2. God, who at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Hath in these last days. That's present tense. So when... The kingdom was set up. The writer of Hebrews was living at the, in those days. The kingdom was already in existence because these are the last days. It wasn't eighty seventy? It's not sometime yet in the future. But God hath in these last days spoken. Now that's past tense. Hath spoken unto us by His Son. We know the Lord's house is the church. We know that. Paul writes to Timothy about that. If I tarry long, thou mayest know how thou shalt behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground. It's true. So we know that the house of the Lord is the church of the Lord, and we know that the church and the kingdom are the same thing. Because Paul wrote to the faithful brethren at Colossae, who had been translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. If I said to you, my, my wife and I entered into marriage 38 years ago, has our marriage taken place? Sure it has, has Anybody can understand that. And yet, there are so many people who read what Paul wrote here to the Colossians when he says that God hath translated us from the power of darkness 
into the kingdom of God's Son. They, are, they have been translated into the kingdom. How could they do that if the kingdom was not in existence? It would be impossible. In the same passage, he says that the Son is the head of the church and has preeminence in all things. That's down at verse 18. Furthermore, let's notice also, when John wrote the Revelation letter, he said, I am, not I will be, not sometime in the future, but I am your brother and companion in the kingdom. Revelation 1, verse 9. Isaiah said the house of the Lord, the kingdom, would be established in the last days. Well, the Hebrew writer wrote that these are the last days. And in chapter 3, verse 6, by the way, Jesus as the Son over his own house, whose house are we? Isaiah also wrote that the Lord's house would be established in the top of the mountains. It's a physical description of the location of Jerusalem. It's surrounded by great mountain ranges. And this idea about established in the top of the mountains, or oh, it's the, the house of the Lord is the highest thing on this earth that we can think about. It's the city that's set on a hill, like our lives are to be. A city set on a hill that cannot be hid. Someone says, yeah, yeah, but aren't the church and the kingdom different? Aren't they two separate entities? Aren't they things that, that may, well, maybe they have some resemblance to one another in, in terms of kinship. But aren't they the same thing? And no, we go back. To Matthew 16, once again, we talked about it last night. When Jesus said there in verse 18, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Our Lord used the terms, the church and the kingdom to describe the same institution, the same body. It is so amazing that so many people don't understand that. Thus the kingdom that Daniel talked about in the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream is in existence. And it's the Lord's church. Those who talk about Christ coming back someday, He will come back to the earth and He'll set up His kingdom. They are in error. Because He has already set it up. Even from the time of the Jews in Jesus' day, there was a great misunderstanding about the nature of the kingdom. And that's the same false idea that people have today. They think of Christ coming back to set up an earthly kingdom. As a matter of fact, the, the twelve misunderstood this up until a certain point of time. And when we look over, for instance, at John chapter 6, after Jesus had fed that enormous multitude of 5,000 men with the five barley loaves and the two fishes, and they gathered up the remains that were left. Well, if we drop down to verse 15, we find out that the people tried to take him by force and make him the king. They did not understand the nature of that kingdom. 
But it's very strange also that when Jesus began at that point teaching the truth about such things, we're told from that time many of the disciples turned away and walked with him no more. People have this misconception that the kingdom has not been set up. But it has. We've seen the interchangeability between these terms, the church and the kingdom we have read at the time when the kingdom would be set up. And dearly beloved, if Jesus came to this earth to set up an earthly kingdom like people today and perhaps at earlier times have said, that's not only error to say, well, he couldn't do that because they rejected him. It's not only error, it's blasphemy. It's blasphemy for one thing because it makes man more powerful than God. That cannot be. Jesus came to do the will of the Father. Said that in John 6, 68, that we talked about already this week. He came to do it. And He said, I will build my church before He was ever arrested, before He ever made the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, before all of these mock trials that He went through. He had already said, I will build my church. Now how in the world then could it be some stopgap measure, as some people say? How can it be a substitute for what he intended to do when he had already told the disciples his intention was to build his church? People need to read more carefully what the scriptures say, and forget the wild theories of men. Forget about these interpretations that twist the scriptures and rest them to their own destruction. And believe them for what they say. Since the kingdom and the church then are the same thing, and since the Bible says that the Lord adds to the church daily, Acts 2 verse 47, those who were being saved, it's necessary to be in that kingdom, in that church. Since that is the case, those who say the kingdom is yet future are claiming not to be saved. They're right. They're right. Isn't it amazing, too, that some uh, folks like that who say the kingdom had to be delayed because they rejected Christ and he couldn't set it up? Why did they call him king? How can he be king if he doesn't have a kingdom? And yet they do. Well, the answer, of course, is he has a kingdom. It's set up. And we know exactly when it was going to be set up. Way back in the Old Testament. We go back to Daniel again, can't we? You knew we were going there. I know you did. Because there is no passage of Scripture any more clear than when the kingdom would be established. Daniel said, Daniel 7, beginning with verse 13 and 14, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. Where did he come to? Watch it. And came to the ancient of days. That's the Father. And they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, go back to verse two or chapter two, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not 
be destroyed. What did Daniel say? He said that I saw in the night visions one like the Son of Man. You remember how uh, Matthew records how Jesus, in fact, re referred himself as the Son of Man. The Son of Man. That's Christ. And so I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. After spending 40 days with his disciples, after his resurrection, Jesus ascended back to the Father. He ascended back to him in the clouds. And what happened when he ascended back to the Father? In the clouds. Well, they brought him to the ancient of days, brought him near before him. Then what happened? He's ascended back to the Father. They bring him near before him. Well, what happens? There was given him, was given him, at, when he ascended, dominion and glory and a kingdom. that all people, nations, and languages should serve Him. When He ascends back to the Father, now what do men tell us? Well, that Jesus is coming back to this earth, and He's going to set up a kingdom. According to Daniel, they've got Him going the wrong way. They've got Him coming, descending back to this earth. But no. He would receive that kingdom when He ascended back to the ancient of days, to His Father. There's not any passage of Scripture that is more devastating and destructive to this idea of a millennial reign of Christ before the end of time. Now, since the kingdom and the church are one and the same, and since in this kingdom, in the church, is where the saved are, it is absolutely essential that we be able to recognize it. Because it's present on this earth. There are those who think that if after the falling away, there were none who were members of the true church, then uh, the kingdom cannot uh, exist on this earth because they can't understand how in the world it could continue if that were the case. Now, we don't know whether it was or not. But the fact of the matter is that if you had God in heaven, you had the Christ, the King in heaven, and you had His Word down here, you don't have to worry about those things because where this Word goes and where it's obeyed, results in the kingdom. It results in the church of Christ. So we need then to know how to be in that kingdom. Some who claim that we don't have to obey Him say, well, just believe on Him. He'll save you. That's all you have to do. But the fact of the matter is that there's more to it than that. We've talked about those things all week long. And we've pointed out how first Jesus himself said, right before he ascended, by the way. Catch that. Put a finger on that. That it's right before he ascended. Go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. And then on that day of Pentecost, when it had fully come, the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles and they began to speak in other languages. And the crowd gathered and Peter told them that this Jesus whom you crucified 
with wicked hands, but by the determined counsel of God. God planned it that way. He knew it was going to be that Jesus would die. You have by wicked hands crucified and slain. And let every one of you know that this one that you crucified, God hath made Lord and Christ. We know what Christ means. The Messiah. The anointed one. God hath made him Lord and Christ. He's already sitting back to the Father. So now the people ask, men and brethren, what shall we do? And of course, they are told exactly what to do. To repent. To be baptized for the remission of sin. This gains entrance into the kingdom. And it's one of those ways that we can identify the heavenly kingdom on this earth. There are other ways that we can identify it. Because the New Testament is a blueprint. It is a pattern for us. It has the details of the plan. And when we look into it, we recognize in, in very short order how Christ is the head of the church. That God has made him the head over all things to the church, Ephesians 1, and 23. And so says Colossians 1.18, that in all things he might have the preeminence. He is the head of the church. But then in each congregation, there are to be, when there are qualified men, those who are appointed as elders. And in uh, 1 Timothy 3, where we read about their qualifications, we all read, also read about those of deacons. This is, this is its organization. That doesn't compare with the monstrosities that we see in the world, uh, religious world about us. Where in some cases you've got one bishop over a plurality of churches. No, in the New Testament pattern, there is a plurality of bishops overseeing one congregation. That's the New Testament pattern, and no one can find anything contrary to that anywhere in this book. It's not there. And so if I want to identify this kingdom that the God of heaven set up in these last days, I can look at to the organization. But I can also look to its worship. This is a real distinction, isn't it? You can, I hope you don't do this very often, but you can turn on the television and you can look at some of these outlandish things that they have on there called worship services and they look more like a, like a dance or big party or something and without question the most distinctive difference when you look at the worship of most of the churches about us and the Lord's church is in the singing Paul wrote of course to the Ephesians in Ephesians 5 9 speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. And in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Nowhere is there any mention, no authority, for mechanical instruments of music in the worship service. As I was looking at the internet today, I came across a website, and I don't really know whose it was, 
but it, it asks some very pointy questions of these members of the Church of Christ. And one of the questions was, well now, wait a minute, if uh, we have to have authority for what we do, then how can we use pitch pipes? How can we have songbooks? How can we have pews? I've never heard a pew seeing it, but uh, nevertheless, they threw that in there. The fact of the matter is, all a pitch pipe is used for is for the song reader to get the pitch of the song if he, if he needs it. I couldn't use one. I don't know how. A lot of others don't either, but, but nevertheless, it's, it's just a maid. Well, they go on and they say, well, if that's just an aid, what about the piano? Isn't it just an aid too? No. The pitch pipe knows when to shut up. That's all it's used for is to get the pitch. It's not part of the, uh, of the, the singing. It's not part of the worship service. But we are told in the New Testament that there are five acts of worship that we're to perform. That singing is one of them. And by the way, you look at every verse in the New Testament where singing is mentioned and you won't find a mechanical instrument in any one of them. We're to sing, Paul and Silas, as we said last night, we're singing praises unto God at midnight in Acts 16, verse 25. So they're singing and there's praying. Nobody argues with that. And of course, there is the Lord's Supper taken on the first day of every week, Acts 20, verse 7. There is the giving of our means, as is recorded in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. And it's the only authority we have for raising money in the church. And then, of course, there's the teaching and preaching. And there's nothing else that is authorized in the New Testament. Now, who does these things as the New Testament says to do them. The church of Christ. The Lord's church. The kingdom of Christ. There's no others. And remember how we said that God hath made him the head over all things to the church there in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And then says in chapter 4 and verse 4, it's one body. If the church is his body and there's one body, there's just one church. It's all there can be according to the New Testament. And we don't have anything else to go by but the New Testament. There's only one body. Only one church. And I can identify it by its organization, by its worship, by its work, well, I'll tell you what, there are those that are churches using the term very generously, and you wouldn't believe the things that go on there. There are those that meet in the bar and drink. There are those that have a big country western uh, concert. Maybe they give a little bit of some kind of spiritual message. They call it a catwalk. It's amazing to me the names that men come up with. We passed one coming down here that said uh, something to the effect of, of uh, rejoicing fellowship of whatever. And he doesn't even know what they're talking about. If the church belongs to Christ, that's where his name, because it's his bride. If my wife started calling herself by some other man's last name, I wouldn't be very happy about it, and neither would any of you other men. Church wears his name. Because she's his brother. We can recognize her. 
This is the kingdom that was foreseen by Daniel, by Isaiah, by others of the Old Testament prophets. It is the church that we must be in today if we are to be among the saved because that's what, again, I know we repeat it over and over, but it's what Acts 2.47 says. The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. The question for us is, have we recognized this kingdom through these identifying marks and understood, yes, this is the heavenly kingdom in its presence upon the earth. I'm not a member of it, someone might understand. I need to do what Jesus said. I need to come to Him believing that He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Turning away from my sin, that's repentance. And being baptized for the remission of those sins. Rising to walk in the newness of life. And if I am a member of that kingdom and I get off course, if I begin to walk disorderly, I need to come back. I need to make that right with God. There may be someone here tonight who's never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and been added to the church, the heavenly kingdom that is now present upon the earth. If you haven't, we would encourage you to do so. If you haven't been faithful, we would encourage you to come back. Make that right known. Repent of it and ask for the prayers of your brethren. That's God's invitation. As we've said, it's not ours. Not the invitation of man, it's the invitation of God extended while we stand in as we sing.